any rate, I want to talk a little bit about a project we've been working on for the last several years, uh, pretty much since 2013. It's actually, uh, this is kind of round two of it. It was initially just a single project where we were evaluating the effects of hand fishing on a flathead catfish population in East Texas. Uh, that, even though that project had a ton of empirical data, the results uh, were model-based. We did a lot of predictive analysis to try to figure out what, we would, what would happen in the future. Of course, we don't have a crystal ball. So it's good to come back and do some adaptive management, basically, and do a follow-up and see you know, where we write, so to speak, in our, and, and where we ended up. Um, so just a little bit of background. If you don't know what hand fishing is, it's just as simple as it sounds. It's literally the act of catching fish with your bare hands. Uh, anglers or, or catfishmen will get out there in the water during the spawning period and feel around for nesting cavities, logs, riprap, what have you, looking for the catfish that are spawning, and we'll just pull them out. Uh, it was legalized in Texas in 2011, probably has been going on for centuries, decades, but uh, formally legalized recently. Um, and just as soon as it le got legalized, all of these pictures started surfacing online, uh, internet forums, fishing forums. We started seeing a whole slew of these monster trophy flathead catfish being caught in a relatively short amount of time. And for those of you not familiar with flathead angling, we don't see that very often. It's rare to see a big fish caught, let alone that many just like that. So as you can imagine, that elicited a knee-jerk reaction. You know, a quick, oh my goodness, the sky is falling. What do we do about this? Surely this cannot be sustainable, right? How, how can we possibly be removing that many big fish and it be sustainable? So we wanted to know whether or not this was fact or fiction. Is, is this sustainable or not? You look at a typical lean frequency histogram, you'll see, I mean, it's kind of common sense that the older, bigger, mature trophy fish are rare, right? They're the older ones in just about any fish population. So the problem is when we dug through the literature, we couldn't find a lot of corroborating evidence or anything to help guide us. Most of it was qualitative in nature. Lots of opinions out there for sure but almost no quantitative data, nothing math-wise to guide us to what, could, what, what, what we should be expecting. So just, for, uh, just to kind of illustrate what is out there in the opinion world, it's kind of, I kind of look at it as like fear-mongering. We're, we're afraid of the unknown. So I pulled some quotations right out of the literature just to show you what I was finding. This method targets large and reproductively mature fish. These anglers are harvest-oriented. They harvest larger fish than other gears. This method is unsustainable. And these are real quotes I pulled out of the literature. This method disturbs spawning and recruitment. It could affect genetic composition. The destruction of nests could ruin catfishing, for real, it's in there. And then last but not least, my favorite, catfish will go extinct. No, I made that one up, just for. <laughs> but you kind of see the theme here. It's, it's the sky is falling type of attitude. So we launched a pretty big study in 2013 in Lake, on Lake Palestine, Texas, one of our premier catfish destinations, especially for flathead. It's just chock full of monster fish. People from all over come and fish that place. Um, and in our evaluation of the flathead catfish fishery, you know, as fisheries managers, we don't have a lot of tools in our tool belt, but in this case, we threw, we threw the book at it. Everything we could in terms of quantifying population dynamics. Uh, we looked at uh, fishing mortality and natural mortality. We did a big reward tax study so that we could estimate fishing mortality. We quantified growth. We estimated population density via market capture. We took all of that data, and then of course we did, did a bunch of, of modeling. Um, if I didn't say it already, this paper is already published in 2016, but I need to go over some of this data because we're going to compare it to round two. So I'm going to gloss over it. If you want the details, you can look it up. Um, anyway, we modeled, we looked at maximum sustainable yield, what would happen to trophy fish abundance, potential recruitment issues. We had a ton of data, I'm not going to lie. It was a pretty good, pretty robust study. I felt good about it when we were done with it. And just to kind of gloss over what we, what we did find, total exploitation from our tag return study was less than 4%. That includes every gear. And I was kind of a little bit taken back by that. I thought, man, that's super low. For, you, see, you guys saw those pictures, right? That's weird. Um, what was interesting about that is that hand fishing was almost half of the total exploitation. Now, mind you, these folks have like a two month window to catch these fish. So they're you know, attributing half of the total fishing mortality in just a few short times. So that really speaks to the effectiveness of this gear. It, it works really well. Okay, so just to kind of tell you a little bit about our model results and what we found, what we did is 
we were at about 3% total exploitation. So what we wanted to know is, we felt pretty comfortable that there were no issues, right? A 3% exploitation, we really could probably just stop right there. But we wanted to know when would it become a problem? How much harvest can we sustain? And so what we did is we systematically increased exploitation to say, when would we hit maximum sustainable yield, which is the peak of the curve? When would we hit growth overfishing, which is when it starts to decline? And then the solid bar is recruitment overfishing. Now, these two lines here, just for reference, because you'll be seeing it in several slides, is this is the entire population's link distribution, and the dotted line is just the trophy fish. So what we found, and I'm going to kind of focus on trophy fish for a moment. What we found is that maximum sustainable yield would occur somewhere around that 10 to 15% mark. Now remember, we're operating at about a 3% right now, so we've got a long way to go before we even hit max yield. Growth overfishing would occur just past that mark, and then recruitment overfishing, we estimated, would occur at about 15%, 17% exploitation. So we felt pretty good about that. But think about what fish these hand fisher, fishers target. You know, the larger reproductive, reproductively mature fish, they're not after the small fish. So to be fair about it and look at what would happen as a result of hand fishing, we, we kept exploitation constant for the young adults and the juveniles, and then systematically increased it for just the trophy fish. And that's what this next graph is. And we see quite a different result. Maximum yield was about at 30% exploitation. Growth overfishing never occurred, and we're estimating exploit or recruitment overfishing to be at about 55%. I don't know many recreational fisheries that would even get that high. As, so we really felt comfortable. And another thing that's notable about the difference between these two graphs is that it really speaks volumes to the importance of young adults in our population. For anybody that knows me for the last couple of years, I've been harping on that, that uh, to create trophy fisheries, we've got to be mindful of what's happening with our young adults because those are the fish that are creating the trophies. Save that conversation for another day, but it's pretty telling. And this graph is just to kind of illustrate what would happen to the abundance of fish, specifically trophy fish, if exploitation increases. Now we're at about 3% exploitation, so all the way to the left of that graph would essentially simulate an unfished state. You have 100% of your fish that are available to be caught, and any additional harvest would then remove fish from the population, right? We take one out, we're gonna have one less tomorrow. Um, so we know, we can kind of predict, if we just looked at abundance, how exploitation might be changing. So say we look at you know, 50 to 70% of the trophy fish remaining or a drop in abundance, we might be at 20% exploitation. So just kind of store that in your brain as I'll come back to that here in a minute. So basically in short, the previous conclusion from the 2014 study was carry on. We don't see any reason to be alarmed. Our exploitation was less than 4%. Hand fishing is really only effective for a short period of time. Despite its effectiveness, there are a lot of people, there are a lot of people fishing for it. But despite those findings, we still had a little concerns, as we should as fisheries managers, we should always keep our finger on the pulse, right? Because things could change. And we started feeling like things were changing. A lot, of, a lot more people seemed to be interested in the trophy fishery at Lake Palestine. Game wardens were uh, noticing lots more illegal fishing, lots more citations. Um, and also our uh, exploitation rate uh, was estimated from a reward tax study. For those of you that don't know about hand fishers, they're real secretive. They don't really like you in their business and they don't really want to help you because for years their technique has been illegal, right? So we were concerned that maybe there were some severe underreporting of tags despite our best efforts to account for them. So let's just go back out and check things out. Were we right from 2014 or were we not? How far off were we? So we launched another follow-up evaluation in 2018 where we basically just resampled the whole reservoir exactly as we did the first time except this time we didn't do a tagging study we didn't collect otoliths we just wanted to look at standard population metrics abundance size structure to kind of give us an idea are things changing do we need to dig deeper or are we good with where we're at um, and again if we if we go out and we see fewer fish we can get an idea of where we're at on that exploitation line so that's what we did I'm just going to skip to the end real quick before I go through each one of these. I was shocked at how completely unchanged the population appears to be. Looking at CPUE, we have the two bars on the left that's uh, CPUE for all of the whole population, and then these bars on the right, which is for just the trophy fish alone. And the white's 2014 and the black is 2018. You can see that they're not statistically different whatsoever. And in fact, the point estimates for both of those were higher in 2018 despite the addition of hand fishing to that entire time. 
I was a little bit dumbfounded by that, actually. Looking at the link frequency histogram, statistically, these are similar uh, or not different, however you want to say it. Um, just looking at the eyeball test, you can kind of see they're, they're really similar. Looking at other link related metrics, this line here is from 2014 and this line is from 2018. Uh, it's notable that we caught about 500 fish in each of our samples. So it wasn't just a few fish that we're estimating this stuff on. Mean total length. You can't make this stuff up. This is crazy. In 2014, it was 698 millimeters, and in 2018, the mean total length was 699. I couldn't have written that any better than that. I wouldn't have believed it if, if it were somebody else. So feel free to not believe it. <laughs> Looking at PSD, uh, quality preferred and trophy length, none, none of these metrics were greater than six units apart. Uh, Quality link was 95 and 95, preferred link is 75 and 69, uh, an 8% change there, but a 3% increase here. We're calling those similar. I mean, those are not different. Everything else is falling in line with this is not an issue. I think this is particularly meaningful. Again, there's not any quantitative data out there as it relates to this particular type of fishery. Um, I don't see any evidence whatsoever that hand fishing is negatively affecting our catfish population, at least on Lake Palestine, okay? And I don't have any evidence to say it's going to affect it on any other water body. Could it? Absolutely. I could draw up a mathematical scenario where we can over-harvest fish. It's just as simple as taking more out than are coming in, right? It's possible, but our jobs as fisheries managers is to keep our finger on that and regulate and create rules to prevent that from happening. There's no reason that hand fishing could not be a sustainable uh, fishing harvest method. Um, we did not directly evaluate recruitment. I know some of you naysayers would probably want to pick on me for that, but I didn't really have great data to do that. I did have a little bit. I looked at it. I don't see any evidence of any recruitment related issues, but I need more time to be able to do that. Our gears don't really sample the little guys just yet, so I need to be able to uh, catch the bigger fish. Um, less than 1% of our anglers are hand fishing. Again, that just falls in line with the rest of the information that I've presented today. Um, Another thing about hand fishers is, like I said, they, they target and harvest the large adults. And if you go back and play with some of your modeling numbers, I think you're going to find that the ability to create and sustain a trophy fishery hinges more on your ability to regulate harvest on your young adults. And hand fishers don't really seem to target those fish as uh, preferred as they do the big, big fish. Um, again, we only did this on one water body, but I don't have any evidence to suggest it could be a problem anywhere else. So with that, I'll take any questions. I don't have less of time. Thank you. Thank you have plenty of time for questions. Yeah. How much? Do you it's think... got to be a Missouri guy that asks a question. <laughs> <laughs> How so. much do you think the hand fishing harvested because you recognize it versus what was already happening in the region? Oh, I think it's the exact same as it was prior to legalization, if you ask me. I. I these guys were secretive. They're doing it regardless. I think your question was, did it increase after legalization? Is that what your question? Yeah. I don't really have any way to, to answer that directly. I'm sure it increased a little, but when you're talking about 1% of folks, there's there are more big catfish dying of old age at the bottom of that lake than are ending up at the end of somebody's hook or the end of somebody's fingers. Um, and we as fisheries managers should do what we can to make sure that people can use the resource in a sustainable fashion Right now, I don't see any evidence that, that, that that's not possible. Does that answer your question? Well, kind, of. It's kind of the point of it didn't necessarily change anything. If, if people were already doing it illegally. True, true. So you're saying that the study itself is inherently biased because I didn't have an unfished state. In that way, you're right. But the good news is, is it's still sustainable before right. and it's still sustainable now. Right? That's kind of the take home here. We have a resource that's usable tomorrow and the next day. So that was mainly based off of low frequency electric fishing data? You're talking about the follow-up evaluation? Both, 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 both. Yeah, in terms of the abundance and size structure. Yeah, I mean, that's how we caught the fish. So the follow-up question is, are you aware of any validation of that method for indexing size structure? Specifically for flathead catfish, Probably not as much as been for other species, but we don't have any evidence right now of size bias occurring by electricity. But I won't even get into that. That's a that's a that's a can of worms that we could be here all day talking about. In I'll, fact, we've been talking about that for two decades. A talk coming up later after lunch. Right. Uh, 
small size bias against the, 600 and larger on flatheads for low frequency electrification, but it's it's subtle. It's not. The good it's news is, is there are a plethora of different pieces of data that went into this, and they all tell the same story. It isn't like one little piece of data like CPUE that I'm basing this whole thing on. It's a, a treasure trove of information, and it's really agreeing with, with itself, and I feel pretty good about it. Chris, correct me if I'm wrong. Yeah. Didn't most, many of our hand fishers also say they practice catch and release? A lot of them do, yes. Yes. So, so they're not, even though they're, they're either hard, even though they're maybe catching a bunch of fish, they're not keeping a bunch of fish. A lot of them, and I don't know about the legalities in Texas, but I know some of these anglers are tagging their own fish and letting them go so they can see if they can recatch them and see where they go. So they can learn where the, where the holes are type of deal. Uh, but yeah, they do do a little bit of catch and release. Yeah. Yeah. You, know, you, you basically have a flathead catfish factory in that. Oh, there's no doubt about and it. I'm just wondering the effect of hand fishing could be quite different in a system or a river or stream where the recruitment is pretty low. Without pushing. You know, I, I, you know Missouri, we uh, we had a legalized for a, what, a couple months and then we were having a lot of problems with the hand fishermen recording the data and something, so we actually had to shut down. But, uh, that was our concern. I mean, you have a very productive system there. I do. And we don't, I'm not sure they're all like that. <laughs> no, no, you're absolutely right. So in those in those instances, I think it is our, on us to go out and quantify the, the, the population metrics in terms of the dynamic rates and see, look at recruitment. Do we have an issue? And, and in that case, I think it's it would be totally uh, reasonable to regulate that in a way that it's not like Palestine. But at the same token, I don't like necessarily blanket regulations, you know, that frown upon this technique when one outlier lake or one outlier water body, you know, we can't have one bad egg, bad egg spoil it for the rest. There are a lot of populations that can't sustain this. And let's be frank, there just aren't that many flathead catfish anglers, period. We have a top-end predator that is really not utilized at all. I mean, we have a handful of jug liners, not really jug liners, but trot liners that'll go out and catch them. But how many in this room have caught a flathead catfish? Oh, wow, you just okay. <laughs> well, your fisheries biologist, that doesn't count. Yeah, I gotta ask the average angler, but most people don't actively target flathead because they're difficult to catch, right? So. Well, the reservoir that I talked about earlier, uh, that was not the case because we used to have a lot of flatheads caught and now they're just very few. Okay. I think it's an over harvest situation. We have a lot of illegal pan fishing going on. Sure. So I'm not sure if your result just you can blanket it, say everybody. No, and I and I and I wouldn't. I would yeah. say I would say that right now there is no uh, numeric evidence right. that right. I'm incorrect here. Right. That's where I would say. As Mike Allen would say, if you don't like my model, let's try yours, right? <laughs> let's give it a shot elsewhere. I'm not full of but our department. I know. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Quick question, not really re related to your talk. How many people die each year doing this? <laughs> not me, because I don't do it. No, but seriously, it's not legal in our state, and I don't think we're getting any pressure to implement it, but like, is there angler mortality? I think we've heard of one or two maybe in Texas. I don't know if it was related to hand Okay. But, yeah. So do you guys have any restrictions on Breathing apparatus or being able to place artificial spawning boxes. I don't think they're allowed in one of those. They're not even allowed gas or hooks or any type of aid. It's, it's old fashioned. You get in there and you've got to suck around with your fingers. I don't even think they're allowed to 